My name is Mark, and I am the opening keynoter of the fifth edition of DevOps Pro Europe. Welcome. Now, as we all know, Europe and the whole world is facing this pandemic spread of the coronavirus. We're all in this fight together. DevOps Pro Europe conference is sending a shout out and wishing good health to all of you and your families. So thank you very much for joining this DevOps Pro Europe conference in this new virtual format to learn, connect and code together. The way we see it, there's a silver lining to this. As DevOps Pro Europe is no longer restricted by the venue, the number of tracks has increased from four to five, meaning that we now have more than 50 introductory and deep dive talks in the following two days. Finally, an important note regarding questions and answers. We will be using Slido for Q&A sessions, so you will be able to ask the questions using your cell phone. Just join slido.com with event code DevOps2020. A Q&A will be available for the majority of the sessions. Once again, thank you for your trust, and we wish you a very productive conference. Now, on with the show. The Great Escape from Project Plan Prison. I'm sure many of you have felt entrapped by a project prison before. I certainly have. And I'd like to share some thoughts with you on how to escape. Now, please join in by uh, joining us on Slido with hashtag DevOps2020. And feel free to get in touch with me. My contact details are on the left there. Now, who am I to share this with you? I've traveled a fair bit business-wise, more than 30 countries, I believe. In fact, Google thinks that I work at Amsterdam Airport. That's how much I travel. But I, I travel, speak, and engage with various communities. And I feel like a bit of a bridge builder between communities. Love doing that. And great to have the opportunity to share some, uh, some of what I've picked up over the years uh, with you in this presentation, which has a pretty simple agenda. Of course, we're going to escape from Project Plan Prison, but I'd also like to share with you a lovely little uh, illustration that I came up with um, last year. Certainly very co colourful. And it helps me get a better understanding of where I am in a particular situation. I hope you find it useful too. Towards the end of the presentation, I'll refer to a book that I recently uh, compiled. And there's a bit of a surprise at the end of the presentation, but we'll get, to get back to that later. I've noticed at conferences, uh, physical, certainly people like to take pictures of slides and uh, at virtual conferences you might like to take screenshots from time to time. Now you can take pictures of any slide that you like except that when you see the sign, the no photo sign down bottom right, I'm still in the process of building up an animated slide. So if you want the full build just wait until uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the sign vanishes then you can relax and uh, do the screenshot. So that's my, that's my modest contribution to the conference industry. Uh, speaking of conferences, what I've also noticed is that there are certain dynamics at conferences, dynamics between the, the presenter who's usually droning on about a topic that he or she is, uh, is passionate about, like I am. You'll be asking yourself three questions. I think you'll recognize these. First question is, huh? What on earth is he talking about? because I might be using slightly different language than the language that you're used to. I'm speaking from my frame of mind, and you're listening from a different perspective. So that's the first hurdle that we have to take. The second one is, assuming that you know what I'm talking about, really, what's that based on? Is there any evidence for that? You might be quite uh, critical about that. And finally, I think the most important question is, so, so what? When I get back to work, what's the relevance of all of this? And these questions hurt really so 
I think they're, they're pretty important things to think about uh, at, um, at conferences. And to help you with the final question, to preempt that question a little bit, to guide you in a certain direction with some possible takeaways, I'd like to suggest that you might get this out of the presentation. Um, a major statement, sometimes life is predictable, sometimes it isn't. And don't pretend that it is when it isn't. That's the key point there. Think about predictability. Try and make sense of your organizational system in terms of predictability and be aware of your natural bias to see it in a certain way. I'll come back to that later. That might seem a little bit cryptic at the moment. The third point is think about the knowledge that you have about a situation and also the knowability, whether knowledge is actually available or whether you're talking about uh, something that is unknowable. Um, depending on the situation, you'll take different approaches. So that's the, uh, that's, I think they could be the major, major takeaways. Now, you may be familiar with an English saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. The horse will decide for itself whether it wants to drink. Similarly, I can lead you to a thought, but I can't make you think. You'll decide that for yourself. And this is one of my favorite cartoons. Um, this is just human nature. People, even you, are looking for the quick fix. And you might be seduced into taking a simple um, answer, which is wrong, instead of making the effort. Mind you, you've, uh, you, you're attending this presentation, so you're making the effort, going for the complex but right answer. I think this is, uh, this is very, uh, very true. Now, I wonder whether any of you recognize this gentleman. His name is Taichi Ono, and he was the father of the Toyota production system in Japan, which is seen as the precursor of the lean movement. And he came up with some great sayings, uh, one of which, this is one of my favorites, that you have to think for yourself and face your own difficulties. Stop trying to borrow wisdom from other people. In other words, what worked for somebody else, and you'll find this at conferences, people are talking about their experience, how they've solved particular problems. Their circumstances were probably quite different from yours. So there's absolutely no guarantee. In fact, it's probably unlikely that what worked for them would work for you. Even if those people repeat the same thing half a year later, their situation might have changed and they might not achieve the same results either. So be, be careful with, uh, with copying um, best practice. You really have to think about your own situation. And that's, that's something that, um, that's uh, an undercurrent behind this whole presentation. Now, speaking about project plan prison, I'm sure you've come across project wardens or prison wardens or project managers like these who come up with these mythical milestones which give them the illusion of certainty with detailed work breakdowns, tasks that are assigned to people with certain amounts of uh, a time for each task. Um, but you know better. The system's too, uh, too, too, uh, too complex. And in fact, you have to dig a tunnel out of project plan prison in order to escape to do the work, after which you come back to the prison and you report about this, these fictitious milestones to, the, to, to satisfy the, um, the project manager. This is all too common, that, that divide between the manager's view of the world and what the world actually is. The trouble is that many people think, think in terms of if then else, a very binary zero or one, way of thinking, and certainly in IT, the, and this, is, this is one of the primary paradigms, isn't it? This if then else. Yet, reality is more like if then maybe. If we're talking about complex systems, and, and increasingly we are, you're talking about systems with intrinsic defects. Whether you like it or not, there are defects in the system. 
the good news is that they're usually self-contained. Either they don't manifest themselves at all, or when they do, you can deal with them pretty quickly, so they don't trouble you too much. But sometimes they gang up on you, and inevitable, unpredictable, unique incidents occur, for which you need experienced people. Because, you, because this has never, never happened before, you can't look it up in a book. You have to have knowledgeable people who can feel the right kind of direction to look for the, look for the solution. And even then, they can't guarantee the uh, 100% success. But, so they're making gambles, but they're defensible gambles. They're educated guesses. Now, something critical here in, uh, in, in terms of um, working in teams, if people get blamed for taking the wrong decision, even if it was the best bet that they could, best gamble that they could take, they're going to learn pretty quickly and not do that again. So what you need in teams is a high degree of psychological safety so that people feel comfortable that they will not suffer their reputation or position um, when things don't go as, as expected. Really crucial point, this psychological safety. The industry is paying a lot more attention to this, uh, this phenomenon. Um, this slide, the, the little story around the slide is based on uh, Dr. Richard Cook's very lovely, pretty small white paper. I think it's three or four pages. Uh, how com complex systems fail. You'll find it easily enough as a PDF. He's a, he's a medical guy. He's a practicing anesthesiologist. And his examples come from, from the medical world, but they're equally applicable in our world. Great, um, great reading, that, um, that paper. This brings us on to the topic of systems, which I'll be talking about quite a bit. What is a system? Uh, a coherent set of entities that act with their environment. I think that's how you could characterize a, a system. It's they, it's some kind of coherence, entities that belong to each other in some kind of way, yet are connected with the environment. We often talk about systems as being um, more than their parts. Uh, and within systems, systems thinking, people distinguish between complex, complex adaptive systems and less complex systems. And it's must emphasize it's not binary. Um, it's on a gradient, it's on a spectrum. And on the on the low complexity side of the spectrum, uh, systems have predictable behavior, whereas on the high side of complexity, behavior is not only unpredictable, it's often inexplicable. When things happen, you can't pin it down to one single root cause. There were so many factors, so many variables that influenced it. You know, simply can't, uh, can't explain it, but you have to deal with it. Now, this has consequences in the terms of the, the approaches that you should think about taking. If you think that the system that you're working in, and I'm using system more in the organizational sense than, than a technical system, um, but it's a combination of the two, if it's predictable, then you can take a more confirmatory approach, by which I mean you can make a plan, because you know more or less what's going to happen, you can predict it. You can say, we'll do this, do this, do this, do this, and we'll expect to get these results. You execute the plan and you confirm, tick off the things that you did, the milestones that you achieved, and whether you achieved the results. So it's not a surprise. Whereas with highly complex systems, you, your information horizon is much shorter. There's much more that is unknowable. So you need to take smaller steps, a more um, exploratory, experimental approach. I like the word tinker to play around with the system rather than engineer it. So think about, at the end of each side of the spectrum, think about these, these two different ways of, um, of doing things, uh, confirmatory and exploratory approaches. Uh, which brings us on nicely to an instrument that you can use to make sense of the kind of system that you're in. You can see here uh, five domains. You'd think four, but it's this one in the middle. 
a confused domain. Um, rather than uh, me explaining the framework, I'll get Dave Snowden, the guy who's very much associated with the framework, uh, to explain it for us. We take the three basic systems here, ordered systems, complex systems, chaotic systems. Um, we create a new category called disorder and we divide order into two, simple and complicated. In the simple domain, um, this is an ordered system. That means the relationship between cause and effect exists, is predictable, it can be determined in advance. In simple order, that relationship is self-evident to any reasonable person, as a result of which the decision model is sense, categorize, respond. We see what's coming in, we make it fit previously determined categories, we decide what to do. Um, the model here is that we apply best practice, a phrase which is legitimate in this domain, but illegitimate in other domains. In the complicated domain, there is a relationship between cause and effect, there is a right answer, but it's not self-evident. So I either have to deploy an analytical method, hence sense, analyze, respond, or call in experts who've built expertise within that domain who can make the right decision. Accordingly, I don't apply best practice, I apply good practice, uh, distinction between good and best practice is actually quite important. Um, in a complicated domain, there are several different ways of doing things, all of which legitimate, if you have the right expertise. And trying to force people to adopt one of them is actually quite dangerous. It will basically piss people off, to be honest, to the point where they won't apply best practice where it should be applied. Right? So simple and complicated we're familiar with. Sense categorize, respond. Sense analyze, respond. Best practice or good practice. Complexity, on the other hand, is a system without causality. It's a system of like constraints on agents. Agents modify the system. So our decision model here is probe sense respond. We conduct safe fail experiments. We don't do fail safe design. If an experiment succeeds, we amplify it. If an experiment starts to fail, we dampen it. In fact, we shouldn't even do an experiment unless we've identified our amplification and dampening strategies in advance. And of course, what happens here is we get emergent order. I, something which comes out of this is emergent practice. It's a new way of doing things. It's novel. It may be some combination, but it's different and it's unique. In a chaotic environment, if we enter it deliberately, it's for innovation. But if we enter it accidentally, then we need to stabilize the position quickly. So the decision model is act, sense, respond. We move very quickly to stabilize the situation. Any practice will be completely novel in terms of the way things work. Now you'll notice that that gives us a very easy way of deciding how to work, but it gives us a divergent. We sometimes call this requisite applicability. It basically says, dependent on which space you're in, you should think differently, you should analyze differently, rather than a one-size-fits-all, which has been the tradition of management theory. Now the central space disorder, and this is key, is the space of not knowing which of the domains you're in. And that's where we are most of the time. And the trouble then is we will interpret the situation according to our personal preference for action. Now the danger is if you spend two or three years of your life in a purely bureaucratic process-based role, then you tend to see all problems as a failure of process. If you're a deep expert, then any problem is a failure to give you enough time or resource to do analysis. Uh, natural complexity workers, battlefield commanders, politicians, their reaction to a crisis is to get lots of different people together from lots of different backgrounds in the desperate hope that somebody will come up with the right solution. That's actually quite a good strategy. And of course, the fascists love a crisis because then they can be given absolute command of everybody who has to do what they're told. So what you get in a normal decision environment is that people are in the disordered space assessing the situation according to their preference for action. One of the main functions of the Canavian framework is to allow people to say, hang on a minute, it's complex, therefore we probe, or hang on a minute, that's complicated, which expert shall we bring to bear? Now, there was a lot of information in that, uh, in that short clip. You can find the video on YouTube, the Kniffin framework, easily enough. 
I had to watch it about ten times before I I got the got the essence of it. Now the um, the language, the terminology has changed slightly. You can see in the domain bottom right, it started off being being called simple, then obvious, and now it's clear. Uh, all of the domains start with a C now, and the, the domain disorder in the middle is now called confused, which is a word that I quite like. I quite like being confused. I think that when you know, th when you think you're certain about things, it sort of spoils the fun. Anyway, I've tried to make this um, make this this sense making framework uh, very easy to understand by allocating five words to the five domains, five different kinds of words. Uh, in the confused or unordered domain in the middle, where you don't know which situation you're in, uh, in the clear. Uh, domain where everything is predictable, de is obvious what you have to do, is if then else, it's like baking a cake using a recipe, you just follow the recipe, you've got the ingredients and success is more or less guaranteed. Whereas in the complicated domain, it's like um, getting a rocket to the moon, it's, um, it's, it's, it's difficult, but you can analyze it, there is a right answer. You just have to work hard at it, after which you reach, as expected, aha, we found the answer. Now this is the ordered part. Now moving into the, um, into the more unpredictable part, in the complex domain, I've used the word, huh? Because things surprise you. And if you take the, some of you may have children, um, take the example of raising a child, you don't know what's going to happen. Things are very unpredictable. The behavior emerges. So this is, this is the distinction between complicated and complex. Uh, emergent behavior. And I quite like the metaphor of a bramble bush that you see here, in which there is some coherence. Seems to be some kind of structure, but it's, it's messy coherence. Um, you can't deconstruct a bramble bush and reconstruct it. You know, it's not, not possible. So that's complex. But then finally, in the in the chaotic domain, is what on earth has happened here? Um, you're completely surprised by something, and you have to stabilize it as quickly as possible. The the current Corona virus is uh, unfortunately an excellent example of what's happening on the left hand side of this framework. You can see uh, the governmental leaders trying to stabilize the situation by um, communicating a policy. On the one hand, trying to get people who are too complacent to realize that it's serious and they have to take responsibility. While on the other side, uh, trying to make people who are nervous by disposition not to panic. That's a tough balancing act that they want to stabilize the situation and move it more into the complex area where people in parallel with each other are working on different ways, different approaches to develop a, a vaccination, for instance, uh, or to, uh, to manage the growth, to flatten the curve. So you can, you can see, you can see the, um, the application of these domains in, in that particular situation here. I would like to draw your attention to the, the essential difference between complicated and complex. In the one case, there is a knowable answer. You can, get to the, you can get to the answer, you just have to work at it, or you have to get an expert in who knows the answer. Whereas on the other hand, on the complex area, it's, it's a question of experimentation. And you can, you can see this using the plan, do, check, act cycle that you may be familiar with on the on the complicated area it's more about because you you know things you, it's, it's predictable you can make a plan and you execute the plan and of course you check and you adjust if need be uh, whereas in the complex area there's not much point making a plan other than let's start uh, the emphasis is on doing something checking how it how it worked out, was it positive or negative, the effects, and acting accordingly. 
so that's that's the essence of the of the difference there very important to distinguish between the two now moving on to the second part of the agenda and i'll combine the first part and the second part shortly i'm quite pleased with this um this little diagram that um, that i use to sketch a big picture of what's going on in our it world now, our it world is usually in the blue area we provide products and services to people but there's a demand part and a consume part so let's look at the whole taking demand first if you subdivide demand into three parts you can think about the drivers the business drivers which could be incidents you know things happen you have to have to deal with them or they could be opportunities market opportunities that have to be grasped uh, the next step is to come up with a hypothesis if we do this then this will happen but when you come up with a plausible hypothesis you can move on to the next stage and define requirements functional non-functional requirements so that people can actually build a solution develop a solution which moves us on neatly to the uh, to the provide area here and i've divided this up into something that you'll be very familiar with i think uh, making the distinction between applications and platforms infrastructural platforms that support the development of software products and the um, the provision um, it operations of, uh, of it services digital services now you can imagine if you've done all of these six steps you've now got the system up and running but absolutely no value has been realized until users do something with the system which brings us on to the final part the consume part where i like to subdivide it into information first information is what people get out of the information systems that we build for them and the function of information if you go back to uh, information theory to uh, to claude shannon i think in the 50s uh, the function of information is to reduce uncertainty uh, interesting to think our it industry information technology industry could we could equally have called it um, uncertainty reduction technology urt instead of it because that's the function so we have information that reduces uncertainty so that we can take better decisions but even now after these eight of nine steps still no value has been realized because value is only realized when somebody acts on a decision that's been improved by information that they derived from the information services that we we produced so this is the whole circle and it's really important to realize that although we usually focus on the uh, on the on the bottom uh, bottom part here uh, and we have maybe a bit of influence in the top part it's all interdependent and this is this is this is why i use the the word co-creational in the tight in the subtitle a co-creational digital value chain lots of buzzwords there um co-creational that that uh, in, indicates the the intricate and even intimate dance that service consumer and service provider dance together uh, you have to think about uh, if you look at this see this as a value chain which i made into a circle think about the weakest link in the chain uh, are you making the right investments are you developing things quickly enough is operations resilient are you together with the users co-creating value from the functionality in the information and finally are you assuring conformance to governance risk and compliance requirements whatever is applicable in your company or, or your industry i brought up the um uh, the seminal book the goal eli goldratt in which he talks about the theory of constraints and the fact that for optimal effect you should be will always be working on the weakest link otherwise you're just doing doing sub sub optimization in your own uh, your own organizational entity so that's an important concept i think 
What I'd now like to do is draw the Kinefin framework into the discussion and look at the left-hand side of this model, look at the software development side, and see and think in terms of how much is known or knowable about on the demand side, what has to be done and when, priorities, and on the provide side, who do we need to do it? How many people, what kind of people, what kind of, um, of uh, capacity, knowledge, and how are we going to approach it? So how much knowledge is available about those things? Well, let's, um, let's look at three of the five domains of the, of the Kinefin framework, just to keep it pretty simple. First, the clear domain. If the requirements, priorities, resources, and approach are known, and if you don't need intermediate delivery of uh, deliverables, then it's legitimate to use a waterfall approach. There's nothing wrong with that. If you, like with the Olympic Games, you, you, know, you only need the stadium, at, but when you have the Olympic Games, there's no point having it half a year earlier. So that's, that, that could, in predictable circumstances, be a legitimate approach. Moving on to the complicated domain, if the requirements and priorities are known, so in other words, the business knows what they want, and the, the resources and the approaches are knowable, in other words, you can sort of work out uh, how to do it, um, but you don't know up front, then you could apply, apply the approach of time boxing, where you give yourself a limit to do stuff, and you do the most important things first, so you get the most value out of your investment. That's a legitimate approach in, uh, in, that, uh, in that domain. Now there's an interesting area between complicated and complex, which is referred to as the linear, uh, sorry, liminal domain, that green area. That's the transition between the two. Um, it wasn't mentioned earlier, and I'm not going to go it into detail now, but that is typically the area where scrum um, approaches work well where you have a plausible hypothesis, but unresolved priorities, not quite sure about what's, what's the most important. And if you experiment iteratively and linearly, that's a key distinction between the final example I'll be giving, that's a good way of working in the liminal domain between complicated and complex. Now, finally, the most challenging of, um, of all of them is when users don't actually know what they want or they have ambiguous or conflicting hypotheses, what do you do then? That you could experiment not linearly, but in parallel. That's a good way of, of, uh, of developing um, possible requirements so that the, the users can reflect on those and, um, and choose the best way uh, way of going going forward, and Dave Snowden gives a good example of um, of a an international organisation, worldwide organisation, where they took a user situation and they got a team in part of the world to work on it for eight hours. Then they passed the end result of that team onto another team in the next time zone without any explanation, and this is key, without any explanation of, of what it, it, it's intended for, and they let that team work on that system, develop it further for another eight hours. Then they pass it on to another team, the third team, again, not explaining what it's all about. So they use their imagination. And at the end of the 24 hour cycle, when it came back to the users, the user said, we would never have been able to come up with those ideas. Some were not useful, some were. But this is an example of where you've got teams working independently of each other. That's where you come up with, uh, with interesting ideas. So just, this is, these are examples of, how, uh, examples of how, when you recognize what kind of domain you're in, it gets you thinking of the kind of approaches that are appropriate. Right, another example, final video clip to, um, to illustrate the, the value of, the, of the, the Kinefin framework using the example of a children's party, which sounds quite strange, 
But when you listen to this story, think about how um, things often happen in your business environment and whether you recognize the parallels. Let's imagine, if you can, that you've got to organize a party for a bunch of 11-year-old boys, and you want to apply the three different types of systems that apply in nature. Well, if you assume the party's chaotic, the children are acting at random, you might as well buy the drugs and alcohol so the children can go on a personal experience of self-discovery. Your house may burn down in the process, but what does that matter? All property is theft, and it was socially constructed in the first place. Um, I have friends in California who've tried this. I don't recommend it. Um, the recovery cost is high, but it's a legitimate approach. On the other hand, the one we'll be more familiar with is the ordered systems approach. Here, it's of critical importance to construct clearly articulated learning objectives in advance of the party itself. The learning objective should, of course, be aligned with the mission statement for education in the society to which you belong. Ideally, you should print the learning objectives off on motivational posters with pictures of eagles soaring over valleys and water dropping into ponds and place those around the room where you're going to hold the party. You then produce a project plan for the party. The project plan should have clear milestones throughout the party against which you can measure progress against ideal party outcome. Um, once you've done that, you know, the senior adult can start the party with a motivational videotape after all, you don't want the children wasting time in play, which isn't aligned with the learning objectives of the party itself. And then they should use PowerPoint to demonstrate their personal commitment to the objectives of the party and to show the children how pocket money is linked to the achievement of the milestone targets. Now, of course, the third approach, the complexity approach, is even simpler. Here, we draw a line in the sand known as a boundary in complexity theory, and we turn to the children and say, cross that, you little bastards, and you die. And one of the things you learn pretty fast as an adult is the value of flexible, negotiable boundaries, because rigid boundaries have a habit of becoming brittle and breaking catastrophically. We then use catalytic probes, and I'm deliberately using the jargon of complexity theory now, a football, a videotape, a barbecue, a computer game, something which will stimulate a pattern of activity which is called an attractor. And if it's a beneficial attractor, we stabilize it, we amplify it, if it's a negative attractor, we dampen it or destroy it fairly quickly. So what we do is we manage the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors, within boundaries. And in that simple phrase, we see the promise of complexity theory for organizations and government alike. Uh, I think that's a great example of how, um, how we often apply the wrong approaches. Um, in uh, in circumstances which are unpredictable so how to think about that you'll, you'll probably think about uh, organizing children's parties when you get back to work that wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me at all uh, this is quite a challenge for how to manage less predictable systems and here i've sketched the two on the left hand side predictable systems with confirmatory approaches plans analyses processes the emphasis on control Whereas with unpredictability, it's about hypotheses, experiments, and adjustments, and more about trust. It's about heuristics rather than algorithms. That's the essence there. So that's just something, again, something to consider when you, if you're in the position to organize work, which kind of instruments are you going to use? And often you have to have to consider whether you're, you're um, whether it's wise to make small incremental improvements to the, the box organization goldfish bowl that you're working in, or whether it's time to jump into a new goldfish bowl. In other words, to do some radical rethinking and reconstruction. And that's, of course, that's, that's something that's, uh, that's quite a step. So you, you, you tend to delay that as long as possible. But there will come a time where it's futile to keep improving. You need to, need to make quite a radical change. And this, um, this is inspired by this book, Making Light Work, Peter Johnson's book. Quite lovely little book, academically sound, very readable. He speaks about balancing 
various various aspects talking about giving uh, exercising less traditional control giving people more autonomy but that's not enough people have to accept that autonomy and and demonstrate agency that they actually act which requires competence and confidence and it helps if they're committed to the kind of work that the organizational that organization does um, that helps them to be in the position to exercise more professional judgment more professional discretion because managers can't dictate what has to happen in in specific situations the professional has to judge that for him or herself so that's a key part there that people take take responsibility to a, a comfortable acting and an important part there is people um, should be making use of their values and what you don't want in organizations is that people feel that they have to leave half of their values at the door because they're not welcome you want people as you want the whole person on board uh, it is often not sensible to exhibit all of your values but you certainly want them to exhibit some demonstrate some of them uh, to engage better with the person's whole character and as examples of values here i've used the uh, this 2000 years old the uh, the transcendental transcendentals art science and ethics uh, just to give give an, um, uh, an impression of the breadth of the values which um, uh, which people should have on board you want multi multi talented people so that's something again something to consider if you're in the position to um, to reorganize your your work now i just mentioned values brings us on to a topic of ethics which i'm pretty keen on thinking about this for several years now ethics in it is becoming increasingly important yet we don't talk about it a lot um, really you know eth ethics is is serious shit just think for a moment about the the boeing 737 max tragedy in which software engineering played a crucial role that increasingly our, our work has unprecedented societal and economic effects and i i wrote a book recently i, I mentioned it already i'll we'll come to it in a minute in a minute uh, i asked dave snowden the kneffin guy to write a piece on ethics for the book and it's one of the nicest pieces that was uh, provided for the book now I'll try and make his point in, in in five simple statements technology has an unprecedented impact on society our actions as engineers as practitioners have unintended consequences they can be good they can be bad and we are responsible for those actions and consequences and that's you know that's a painful fact of life but it really means it means that organizations should monitor the behavior of people much better and one of the nicest sentences in dave's piece was um how did he say it he said uh, just as organizations track the their cash flow they should also monitor the flow of virtue through the organization i thought that was such a lovely phrase the flow of virtue uh, and the, the final point is uh, this all leads us to uh, ethics belongs in in education as a core part of the education of of uh, of people in it um, ethics is of course you can't deal with ethics you you can't uh, generate ethical behavior just with education it's very much about the values that are determined by people's upbringing but it's, it certainly is one of the uh, one of the important parts so that's um something i'd encourage you to think about a lot the ethical implications of your work now i mentioned the book a couple of times um these are three of the topics that we've spoken about in the presentation uh, that are in the book um, also the objectives i mentioned but these topics as well the uh, service dominant logic stress prevention safety culture cicd service experience all of these topics are in the well, you know what weird kind of a book is this well i lots of people helped me write this book i engaged with about 50 people almost to get some ideas for the book slightly more than 20 contributed these are some of the contributors 
Um, many of them authors in their own right. Bottom right, Jeff Liker, who wrote a piece about Toyota Kata for the book. He wrote The Toyota Way, the book that sold, I think, 900,000 copies. You know, that's a, that's a serious book. People from 18 countries contributed, and I was delighted that if you look at their core expertise, um, about a third from, was from the IT service management industry, a third from Agile or DevOps, and a third, just like Jeff Liker, Dave Snowden, not really IT people, uh, a third, almost a third from outside IT domains. So I got a fairly broad, uh, broad spectrum of, of experience in the book. And the book, believe it or not, is an ITIL book. It's ITIL, Jim, but not as we know it. Because so I think this is one of the weirdest ITIL books that ever, I hope it is, certainly, the weirdest ITIL books, book that ever, that's ever been published. I'm very fond of it. It's, uh, as, as I would be, um, High Velocity IT, it's called. And I like to say is Guidance That Matters for people like us who care. And it was certainly written by people who care because I've, I've witnessed a lot of love and commitment that's gone into, into this book. And I I'd certainly recommend that you take a look at it. Be aware of its existence. Uh, the publishers, TSO, are offering a 20% discount on, uh, on publications. Um, there's some free stuff such as the Axelos White Paper, ITIL 4 on the co-creation of fast value available. And on my website, which I'll point out at the end, there are more publications. Which brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, major messages, don't pretend that life is predictable when it isn't. It's a major message. Be aware of your natural bias when you're trying to make sense of a system in which domain you're acting, and think about how much knowledge uh, there is and what is knowable, and let, let that determine the kind of approach that you can take in order to escape from project plan prison. Right, this was the agenda. I promised you just one more thing. It's a bit of research I've been doing recently, and it might turn out to be the most useful thing in this presentation. Um, it's about toilets. I have discovered from personal experience that whatever the matter I have to dispose of, in 95% of the cases, a half flush is sufficient. Just think of the amount of water that you save when you apply this, uh, this practice. And, you know, on the 5% of occasions that, uh, that you need a full flush, um, water conservation isn't your highest priority. So with these profound thoughts, I'd like to leave you. Thank you very much. And if you want more information on my website, on the writing side, you'll find some stuff about um, my own thoughts. And more significantly, if you look at the learning part, you'll find the topics that I'm interested in and the teachers who I have learned a lot from. Once again, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Just a couple of questions that we have from you. And by the way, if you, um, if you have some more questions and would like to get in, con in touch with me after the presentation, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or uh, on LinkedIn. Please to make, um, make a connection with you and continue the discussion offline or online rather. Right, a couple of questions. What would you say is your preferred way to conquer complexity within projects? Well, I I saw this, this question came up before I uh, dealt with that in the presentation. So I think it's possibly been answered, at least partially. As what I would, I'm just sorry, I'm just hearing a bit of echo, so I'm turning turning something off. Right. Um, 
preferred way to, con to conquer complexity within projects, apart from the, the examples that I gave you, making the distinction between the scrum techniques when you think it's in the liminal domain between complicated and complex. Um, and the, and you've got, and, uh, and uh, alongside those, those screen, but th I think the interesting thing for me is to distinguish between when Scrum is applicable and when there is a larger degree of uncertainty and when you have to apply pre-Scrum techniques. I think takeaway is to think about pre-Scrum techniques what happens when the when the users don't know exactly what they want where it's unpredictable well sorry where it's um where they have ambiguous or possibly conflicting hypotheses just graph that, that concept and just think about in general think about the concept of you know you can't plan things you can't plan things make the distinction between when you can plan stuff when things are known or knowable and when you simply have to take small steps and experiment. Now, the second question, how would you recommend going around quarantine in the workplace? I, I'm reticent to, to answer this question. Um, you might have seen in my, on my introductory slide, I don't think I mentioned it. Some people know me as the IT paradigmologist because I have a habit of studying IT paradigms. You know, a paradigm is a way of looking at the world, and I think that DevOps is an excellent, uh, excellent example of a paradigm. So I'm a I'm a paradigmologist, not a pandemicologist. So I'm steering clear of giving anybody any advice apart from just keeping your distance and common sense, really. Uh, next one: How could the pandemic affect? How could the pandemic affect the DevOps ecosystem? Yeah, gosh, yeah, that's really on our minds, isn't it? Of course, pandemic. I don't know. That is, um, I'm just making a note of that. That is a topic that's worth a bit of thought. If you follow my uh, blogs on LinkedIn, that's where I do most of my blogs, you might find in the, in the, in the, um, uh, in the future, you might find something coming up on that. So I thank, certainly thank you very much for that uh, for that suggestion. Next question: If I will change, if IT will change after the, the coronavirus pandemic, and in what direction? Uh, again, I'm a bit I'm a bit reticent to to get into that area, but um, just thinking about it. I think one of the significant, one of the things to think about in general is because the, you know, the world's changed at the moment, is when this thing finally passes and we get back to normal, within quotes, what will normal look like? Will, for instance, will we have developed skills in working remotely that we would prefer to continue? It, when we get back to uh, life as we previously knew it, so that's that's something to something to think about. What there's always a, as I said at the beginning, there's always a silver lining to something if you're prepared to look for the uh, look for the positive. So, what kind of capabilities are we building up in this in these difficult times that we could possibly use uh, after um, this dreadful affair? Um, yeah, no, a bit depressing, isn't it? Yeah. So, well, look, look on, look on the bright side. Uh, I think that is it now. Those were the four questions. Um, leaving you, I think, with the with the recommendation to. Um, Keep your distance, of course, and uh, and to flatten the curve, uh, and also, possibly the most significant takeaway of my talk, is to use the half half flush on the toilet, and save a lot of water. So, with those profound thoughts, I think it's time to leave you. Thank you very much again 
and have a great conference. This is, uh, this is such great uh, content you've got in, in store. Thank you.